We are right with God when we are filled with him. Think about that for a second. We are right with God. We have a right standing with God when we are filled with the presence of God. Because it's within the presence of God when we spend time with the Lord and, and we're meditating and, and thinking about the things of the Lord that we're in the right place because we'll do the right things. I think of the disciples when they were out ministering the word of God there in the book of Acts. And these were two fishermen, John and, and Peter. Um, and the religious leaders were listening to them and watching them and, and they were just amazed. They were amazed that, first of all, they were fishermen. They were, they were laborers. They weren't educated men. They didn't go to school. They didn't have any uh, degree of any sort or, uh, at all. And so they were, they were confounded that they were speaking so well and, and preaching in, in the streets and people were converting over to Christianity. And, and they realized that they had no education. They were unlearned men. And, but all they had was that they spent time with Jesus. That's the only thing that they saw in them is that they had spent time with Jesus. And the more that you spend time with Jesus, the more that you're filled with God, the more that you're right with God. And people will see that because your life will shine as the Lord uh, desires it to. Tonight's theme is turn your heart towards God. Turn your hearts towards God. That's so important. And I think of my own life and, and what I have been through and the struggles and the pain, and I think that um, I could not have made it without turning my heart towards God. And not that it was my work, but it's the Lord's work and what He's done in my life, but just keeping my heart with the Lord, keeping it soft and, and pliable to Him and His will, because life can really get hard, and if you meditate and think about the things that we go through, you can really get discouraged and depressed even. And so you really have to turn your heart over to God. You know, let him have it. Uh, trust in him. Know that he has a purpose and a plan. He's the author and finisher of our faith. You know, he, he's writing a book, and he's barely probably in some of your lives in the first chapter. You know, and there's still you know, 8, 10, 12 chapters to go. And so you know, there are a lot of chapters to go. So just hang on. Let him write what he's writing in your life and, and glorify him while he's writing your life out. What we see in chapter 7 through 10 here, um, as we find Jeremiah ministering at the temple gates. And so we're going to take the next few chapters, 7 through 10, and, and look at this ministering as he ministers to the gates of the temple itself, the temple where God is to be worshipped, or where the temple where the priests were to come and offer up sacrifices and offerings and incense and the giving and the treasurings and even the feeding of the poor and so forth and taking care of the Gentiles in their own court and so forth. He's going to deal with, uh, with the people of Judah there in the temple of God in Jerusalem. And so there's a, an illustration here of the, a, a temple security in a sense um, where the people feel safe. They feel close to God because they're in the temple itself. It reminds me of Jesus when he entered into Jerusalem in the triumphal entry. And, and you have the religious leaders and the people, millions coming into Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And, and all these people were coming to the temple itself because the temple meant something. That was where God was. And there's a security there. There's a peace there. There's a rest there. But unfortunately here... In this section, Jeremiah weeps over the attitude of these people because uh, their, their true service of worship was not to the Lord, but it was to idols. And so though they felt like they were secure in the temple of God, yet they were not really secure there. And, and he warns them that their genuine repentance really needs to be their only hope. If they turn back to the Lord and humble themselves before him, then he'll lift them up. And it's interesting how the church is the central place of ministering to God's people today. You know, it's the church. This is where we gather together. Yes, we, we gather uh, out in our workplaces and in homes with our brothers and sisters and, and even with our families and we listen to the radio and maybe some of us uh, read scriptures at night to our children and do uh, Bible studies of some sort or even pray you know we do all those things but there's something different about being in a place together with a corporate b- uh, bunch of believers you know, 
God just seems to meet at that place. I think of the multitudes as they came and they heard Jesus, you know, uh, speaking. And then he said, feed them, feed them. And so they took the few fish and loaves and they multiplied it and they fed all the people together. And, and Jesus does that when, when we're all together, we get fed together. The Lord just seems to direct and guide and lead us in a direction as a church, as a part of the body of Christ. So we're a unique part of the body of Christ, just like another church is a unique part. But we're a unique part, and we have a, a, a place and a purpose to fulfill, and we need to understand that as the body of Christ. And so it's important that we go to church where we minister to one another, not just come and then leave to, to put in our time, because that's what they were doing in the temple. They felt secure, they felt at rest because they came to the temple, they offered up their sacrifice, and then they would leave and they would just offer up their sacrifices to their false gods too, and then live their lives the way they wanted to. No, it's at the temple, it's at church where we come and minister one to another. Oftentimes we have our counseling on Sunday mornings because our lives are so busy, I find that strange. Our lives are so busy, so we have to counsel on Sundays after church instead of picking a day during the week. You know, that, that just reflects where we're at as a culture um, and what is important. And so it's a time constraint. You know, I'm very busy. Squeeze me in between services. I've had that asked of me. Could you squeeze me in between services? No, I can't do that. I got to focus on the word that I'm about to preach for the second time. You know, and, and so the church is the place we minister to, minister one to another. We assemble one with another, encouraging one another because the time is short. And so we should be praying with one another uh, during church services uh, besides the you know, uh, official prayer up here in the front, but praying for one another. You as the body of Christ praying for one another. That's where the ministry is at within the church itself. So important that we don't just come and then we just leave and we live our life and then come back the next following Sunday. And so Judah here is called a hypocrite because of this. And so we see in verse 1 of chapter 7, the word of the Lord it says, The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Stand in the gates of the Lord's house and proclaim there his word, or this word says, he says, or and says, hear the word of the Lord, all you of Judah who enter in at these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Do not trust in these lying words saying, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. That's religious service. What he's saying is you're coming to the temple of the Lord and he's saying, praise God, look at hallelujah, the wonderful temple of the Lord. This is the place. And you come and you come to worship and offer up your sacrifices, but then you go away and you live your life in the natural sense, in the flesh. That's hypocrisy because you're not living it out there as you're living in the world. It's so important as a Christian that we live our life as believers when we're in church and when we are out of church. When we are here amongst one another and how we're well behaved and how we're under control and there's no anger outspurts and there's no cussing and there's no swearing and there's no off jokes and you know all those things that we control ourselves from doing. And then when we go away from the church, we shouldn't be doing those things either. We shouldn't be cussing, we shouldn't be swearing, we shouldn't be telling off jokes, but I find that that happens quite often, that, you, that people will go to work and then they're telling their jokes and they're cussing and they're swearing. Because I've caught people, well, I've worked, who said they were believers and they knew the Lord. You know, it's funny because I, I remember working and I in a, a was um, doing a job and and testing the guy's meter because he was complaining about his bill being too high and so forth. So I was, you know, telling him what I was doing and so forth. And he starts cussing and swearing the whole bit. And, and so uh, we just started talking a little bit. And then he asked me, you know, uh, some questions and so forth. And I always look for opportunities to share Jesus. 
And so he said a certain word, you know, whatever it was, you know, do you hang around people? Oh, yeah, I hang around people all the time. I go to church quite often. See, I'm a believer, and I actually minister in the church. He goes, oh, so am I, you know, and it's just funny how they always say that once I tell them I'm a believer, you know, after they've cussed and they sweared and they've done all those things. Oh, I'm a believer too, you know, and it's how sad that is that they don't live their life like they live in church. Their lives really haven't changed. It really hasn't changed. They're still worshiping their idols. They're still worshiping their idols. See, they felt secure because they attended the temple service. And because they were attending the temple service, they thought that they were fine with the Lord. James tells us that without, fa- without works, your faith is dead. If we say we have faith in God, then there has to be works. And those are positive works. The, the works of the Spirit, Galatians tells us in chapter 5, and that's joy and love and peace and all those good things that we should have as works in our lives as believers. And that's here in the church and outside of the church. And if you believe, then you or your life should have evidence of that belief. You should have fruit of your belief. And it's not just in church, it's outside of church. And so if you come to church and you're a very friendly and kind guy, then when you leave church, you should be a friendly and kind guy out there also. That's the evidence that you believe. Because a person will act on what they really believe. They will act on what they really believe. That's how you tell if someone believes. You watch their life outside of church and that's what they really believe because in church we can be hypocrites and we can put the praise the lord and put the smile on our face and so forth but then when we leave church and we live our life that's really what we believe we're reading all the bad books we're watching all the bad movies we're cussing and swearing you know we're smoking we're taking dope, we're in prescription drugs, whatever it is, you know, that's really what you worship. That is really your faith in God. <clears throat> Let's say that a person comes into the library where you're, you know, you're sitting and you're reading and, you know, everyone's quiet because you want to be quiet at a library and this person comes into the library and he, you know, he kind of shouts a little bit, there's a gunman coming through the doors. There's a gunman. And then all of a sudden uh, he goes and he sits down and he gets a book and he opens it up and starts to read. Would you believe that there was a gunman coming through those doors? No, because he doesn't believe it. If he believed it, he wouldn't be sitting down opening up a book and then reading the book, he would be running out the back door as fast as he could or finding a place to hide because the gunman's coming through that doors. See, if you really believe it, then your life will show it. See, it's the action, the results, the fruit of it. So many people say, yeah, I believe in God. They don't even do God's word. They're not obeying God's word. They're living their life according to their own word that's not an action that shows you believe in god in fact james says the devils the demons say they believe in god and they fear and they tremble because they know god and they know they're not living for god and so you may knock on that door lord lord let me in the lord say i don't even know you because you profess me but obviously you're a worker of iniquity you know your life really doesn't reflect the christian life What is the Christian life? The Christian life is to glorify God. That's the chief end of man, is to glorify God in everything that we do. As individuals, we're to glorify God in our daily living. As married couples, we're to glorify God in our relationship with one another according to what God has said in the Word of God. As singles, we are to glorify God through our bodies and our dedication, through our life, we're to glorify God. Whatever state it is, wherever you're at, if you're working, you're to glorify God in what you're doing. 
giving God glory for the job that you have and doing it because you work unto the Lord, the Bible says. And so you glorify him and people know that you love him. Years ago, there was a gal that I worked with and she just did not like me because you know, I, I lived my faith. I, I, I believed in, I put my little scriptures and books on my, on my desk. I had my Bible on my desk, you know, and I'd catch people reading my stuff all the time. And that was why I did that. And, and so she didn't like that. And she was, she said she was a believer. She went to a church and so forth. And uh, one day, see, this is how they know that you really do believe because they come to you and ask for help. So one day she actually came to me and said, could you pray for me? I'm like, wow, I did not expect that at all. But if you live your life to glorify God, the world will see it and they'll come to you for prayer because they see your faith. See, what God wants of us is what? A personal relationship with him. He wants intimacy. And, and that personal relationship is different with all of us. Totally different. Moses had a unique relationship with God. He saw God in the burning bush, right? Uh, no one else saw God that way. That was his relationship with God. And so when he went down to Egypt, he knew who he had believed in because he experienced God. And he went down with power and might, though he still doubted the Lord, and the Lord had to use Aaron. But then you come to Joshua, totally different guy. He didn't see the burning bush, but he had a different relationship with the Lord. He was a little timid. He was a little fearful when he first started, you know. And so the Lord had to give him some encouragement. And Moses gave him some encouragement, and then the Lord gave him some encouragement, and then even the people had to give him some encouragement. Then finally, he, he had to get out there and, and walk by faith. And what happened? God took him and began to show him victories. And his faith grew even more than what it was in the beginning when he was ready to go into the promised land. So all our faiths in God and relationships are all different. They're very unique, and we can't take that away from one another. That's what makes God so, so interesting is, is that he has a relationship with every one of us that, that is unique in an in interesting sense. Um, in a minute here, I'm going to talk a little bit about prayer, but I have a unique way of, of praying with the Lord. And so what he wants is that personal relationship with you. He wants to spend time with you. He wants to commune with you. He wants to talk with you at all times. That's really what the Lord wants of us, not to, not to play these games where we come to church and then we leave as hypocrites. He goes on in verse 5, For if you thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if you thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, so apparently you know, they were struggling with one another, fights and bickering and so forth. And if you do not oppress the stranger, the fatherless, the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place or walk after other gods to hurt your, or to your hurt, then I will cause you to dwell in this place, in the land that I give uh, to your fathers forever and ever. Look, if you just stop the oppression upon people and the widows and the poor, if you just stop hurting yourself by worshiping your idols, by worshiping your own words, and just trust in me, have faith in me, then I will set you in this place forever and ever. Behold, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to Baal, and walk after other gods whom you do not know, and then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered to do all these abominations? That's an interesting verse there. Here you do all of these things and then you come and stand before me and you raise your hands up and you worship me while you're sinning, while you're worshiping idols before you get there. <clears throat> I like some of the, the old stories listening to the old guys that uh, came to the Lord during the uh, tent revival. You know, a lot of them will tell you, you know, when we went down there, we were stone high. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we were wasted, and we get there, and we're like, wow, this is great, you know, but they're all stone high, and they're raising their hands, and they're worshiping the Lord. God converted their hearts over. See, that's, the, that's how salvation works, taking a dead heart and renewing it into a new heart, but it's when a new heart is worshiping other things. It's when a new heart is supposed to be loving the Lord, and it's not. It's into all kinds of sin and transgressions, and then it comes to church and say, I'm all right. 
No, you're not all right. It's an abomination, he says. Has this house, which I call by my name, become a den of thieves in your eyes? Uh, Jesus quotes this from Jeremiah. Remember when he enters in Jerusalem? He says, you turned my father's house into a den of thieves, just like Jeremiah. And that's why they thought, is this Jeremiah, one of the prophets, when they spoke about Jesus? Den of thieves, they come in to make a profit off the Lord's people. Behold, I, even I, have seen it, says the Lord. But go now to my people, which is in Shiloh, where I set my name at the first, and see what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people Israel. And now because you have done all these works, says the Lord, and I spoke to you, raising, rising up early and speaking, but you did not hear, and I call you, but you did not answer. Therefore, I will do to the house which is called by my name in which you trust and to this place which I gave to you and your fathers as I have done to Shiloh. Now, Shiloh was an earlier place where they worshiped the Lord. They had set up the tabernacle and so forth, but the Lord had to destroy that because of their sin. And so now he's saying, is that what's going to happen here? And I will cast you out of my sight as I have cast out all your brethren, the whole posterity of Ephraim. Now, Jeremiah is literally asked not to pray for them because of this sin. I find that interesting here. The implication is, is Jeremiah's been praying for them, right? He's been on his face. He's been on his knees. He's been saying, Lord, wake these people up. Grab them by the ear. Do something, Lord. Get to their hearts. I don't know what it is that you need to do, but you need to do something, Lord. Well, he does something. He sends Babylon in there to send them into captivity. You know, but his heart was to wake them up. I hope you see that heart in a pastor that's begging the people to get involved and to participate. That's the whole purpose of us gathering together is to make an impact in this world, in this community. Do something great. That summer fest was wonderful. You know, though it was a huge thing and it was way out of our reach, yet God had grace and we saw people come to the Lord. And we loved people. That's what really got me, is that these people had no idea who we were. And here we come... And we just love them. We don't know what's going on in their lives. We don't know what they've done. And we just fed them. And we shared music with them. And we took time with them. And we painted their daughter's nails. And we painted their faces. And they played games and so forth. And that's why they asked, why are you doing this? Why are you giving us food for free? That's the love of God. That was awesome in my sight. I love that. Just Even if I saw nobody come to the Lord, we did what we were supposed to do, and that was just let them know that God loves them. And it was preached to them, and it was preached clearly. And we took that public park, and we turned it into the temple of God, in a sense, on those Friday nights. We really did. That's what we should continue to do. And I hope that we continue to do that. So the implication here is Jeremiah prayed, prayed for them. You know, Martin Luther said that if I fail to spend two hours in prayer each morning, the devil gets the victory through the day. I have so much business I cannot get on without spending three hours daily in prayer. Imagine that. Three hours a day in prayer Martin Luther spent. But I understand that. He didn't have a job, you know. He could stay all day in his place and, you know, wake up early, spend three hours and the rest of the time studying and dissecting the scriptures and translating them. And that's what, that's what he did. So, you know, that, it's not as big to me, but it's still a big deal to me. Three hours is a lot of hours. John Wesley said, prayer is where the action is. Isn't that true? And when we get on our knees, that's where the power, the strength is. And we need to pray. Pray through all things. Corey Tim Boone said, don't pray when you feel like it. Have an appointment with the Lord and keep it. A man is powerful on his knees. Make an appointment with God. And then keep that appointment to pray for the Lord. Let me ask you, how much time do you take to pray to God on a daily basis? How much time do you take? 
I have a different view of prayer. I like what Paul said. He said, pray without ceasing. Wow, (laughs) wait a minute. Three hours is a long time. Now you're saying pray without ceasing? That means all day long be in prayer. See, prayer isn't about on your, being on your knees or laying prostrated on the ground. It's not the position. It's the heart and the relationship with God that God sees. And so we can be praying without ceasing. I love that because I do that. I pray when I wake up in the morning, and then I pray as I'm getting ready in the morning, and then I pray as I'm coming to church or whatever it is I'm doing, I'm praying, and I'm praying in the car, and, and he brings to mind people. I get my text messages that, you know, Brother Rogers got ammonia, start praying for him. You know, uh, I get a call from from Stephen over there, that guy, you know, and <laughs> and I, you know, I, I, I pray and I put it on the, you know, it's praying without ceasing. I love that. For one, I don't feel convicted that I'm sitting apart three hours in the morning to pray because I can't do that. But I can pray without ceasing. I can pray all day long. And when the Lord brings to mind somebody, I pray. I can do that and not feel guilty because I am praying. And I pray every day like that. And I'm praying as I'm going to bed in the evening. So praying without ceasing, I, I like that. And that's what Jeremiah, I believe, did. Prayed for Judah and Israel without ceasing, praying, praying. There are times where I even pray while I'm up here. Lord, am I making any sense? Please help me. <laughs> you know, Lord. In my head, and then while I'm preaching, I'm thinking, Lord, give me strength. Give me the words. If I hesitate, it's because I'm praying, Lord, how can I say this? You know, so without ceasing, praying. I love that. Therefore, do not pray for this people, he said. But isn't it interesting? God says, don't pray. Don't pray, nor lift up a cry or prayer for them, nor make intercession for, to me, for I will not hear you. Do you not see what they do in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood, the fathers kindle a fire, the women need dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven. They worship the queen of heaven, um, <clears throat> an idol, a figure. A woman, the Catholic Church does that today. They call her the Queen of Heaven, Mary, the mother of Jesus. You know, nothing's changed under the sun. They, they pour out drink offerings to other gods that they may provoke me to anger. Do they provoke me to anger, says the Lord? Do they not provoke themselves to the shame of their own faces? Therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, my anger and my fury will be poured out on this place, on man, and on the beast, and on the trees of the field, and on the fruit of the ground, and it will burn and not be quenched. Reference to the tribulation period when God's judgment will come. He's storing it up in a sense. You know, he's having so much grace on us right now, isn't he? But he sure is giving us plenty of evidence of what's going on. And is this Ebola virus interesting? How they said there's no way that it's going to... um, you know, began to be uh, spread here in the United States, and boom, one guy in Texas gets it. Now another guy gets it. You know, where is it going to stop? And that's just one of many viruses that are out there. Pestilence in the last days. Now, these are birth pangs. They're all birth pangs, earthquakes, you know, uh, that are happening in the world today. Signs in the skies and, and so forth, you know. These are all birth pangs. We need to see this stuff, we that are as children. He goes on and says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Add your burnt offerings to your sacrifices and eat meat. For I did not speak to your fathers or command them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices. But this is what I commanded them, saying, Obey my voice. And I will be your God. You can't get any clearer than that. Obey my voice. And Jesus said, my sheep will hear my voice. And James tells us in one twenty one, be doers of the word and not just hearers only. Obey my voice and I will be your God. Boy, I want him to be my God. Because when he's my God, then I don't have to worry. Because when you got him on your side... 
You don't have any fears whatsoever. When I was in uh, elementary school, I used to get into a lot of fights. And so, well, actually, I, you can't call them fights because I got beat up all the time. I didn't know how to fight. So I, I used to get beat up a lot. Well, finally, a police officer, long story short, he, he told me, you got to start defending yourself. You know, well, I don't know how. It was just, you better learn because <laughs> they're going to find out that you're, you're not able to fight and they're going to be picking on you all the time. Well, I used to have a, a friend, his name was Barry, and this guy was big for, for his age. And so he would actually come to my defense uh, from time to time during, during school hours. He would see the kids picking on me, and so he'd come in and say, leave him alone. And he'd just kind of push him away. Psh, they go flying, you know, at least what I can remember. Go psh, hit the wall and it, you know, type of thing. And he, and he, like, he would protect me. He would protect me, you know. And I thought it was strange, but he, you know, maybe had that mentality as I protect the, you know, the the losing team, (laughs) in a sense. (laughs) Uh, But he protected me, and that's how the Lord is. When he's on our side, he protects us. You know, it's good to have him on your side. It's good to have Barry on your side. I had him on my side until I learned how to fight, you know, and so forth. So it's good to have the Lord on your side. I mean, if you obey his voice, I'll be your God, and you shall be my people, and walk in all the ways that I have commanded you. In, In how many ways? The 152 ways? No, in all my ways that I command you, that it may be well with you. Yet, verse 24, they did not obey or incline their ear, but followed the counsel and the dictates of their evil hearts and went backward and not forward. Hard ministry for him, isn't it? <laughs> Hard ministry to to try to get at the heart of these people, to open them up to God and to see that the path that they're on is wrong and they won't listen to you. That's probably the hardest part of being a pastor when you give great advice and they don't listen and they take their own advice, their own dictates of their own evil hearts. But, you know, it's not our responsibility to change people. It's not my responsibility. I am only to water the seeds that have been planted or plant seeds. That's my responsibility. I'm just to preach the word and make sure that it's clearly preached and people understand it. And it's up to them whether they want to believe it or not, whether they want to apply it to their own lives, because in the end, they will stand in judgment before God themselves. And he will judge them on what they've done, good and bad as believers before the beam of seat of Christ. Not the great white throne judgment where the unbelievers, but God will judge you for what you have done, what you have done with his son here, what you have done with his word. But that's not my responsibility as a pastor. So that kind of lightens the load for me (laughs) in a sense that if you respond, that's wonderful. And then we just get more done in the kingdom of God. But if you don't respond, then that's still wonderful. I mean, I'm doing my job what I'm called to do, and it's sad for you that you're not getting it, or those that are listening that they're not getting it, and so they have to go through what they need to go through. But we water, and we plant, and we see what God does. What God does is His business, and what He does with it is His business, and how He does it. I remember it was Thanksgiving Day, and I was with my family in Roland Heights. And so there, we had a very small house, and so we put a table in the, in the dining room, living room together to fit everybody at. And here I, here's my dad, and I'm trying to witness to him, just sharing with him about Jesus Christ. And he keeps throwing different questions and, and things at me and so forth. And my sister invited a friend of hers to our Thanksgiving dinner, and he just sat there, and he listened the whole time. Every once in a while, he would ask a question, and i just give him the answer, and then I'd go back, okay, Dad, now listen, this is what Christ has done, is it, you know, and try to explain to him what Catholicism was, and what the difference is of Protestantism, and so forth, and he kept saying, you got your Jesus, I got mine. And I go, well, at least you're true, you're right there, this is the right Jesus, and you got the wrong Jesus, you know, but I just kept witnessing to him, and I kept Wanting him to accept the Lord, that's, that was my heart. I was trying, almost in a sense, trying to force him to do that instead of realizing I'm just to plant seeds and water. But I was young at that, that stage. 
And so I was finally done and frustrated and like, ugh. So I walked outside and, and all of a sudden this guy follows me and he said, I want to accept Jesus into my heart. And I'm like, okay. I'm like, Lord, that's not who I wanted to accept. I wanted my dad to come to Jesus, not this guy. But it was like, okay, you know, so I led him to the Lord. You know? So it's the Lord's work, not mine. I mean, I wasn't even interested in the individual, but God was working in his heart through the words that were spoken. And the Lord brought an increase there. So we don't know. Don't be discouraged just because people don't respond to your words. You, you plant and you water. That's what Jeremiah did. And of course, in Jeremiah's day, nobody, nobody responded at all. He goes on, since the day that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt until this day, I have even sent to you all my servants, the prophets, daily rising up early and sending them. Yet you did not obey me or incline their ear but stiffened their necks. They did not worse. They did worse than their fathers. Stiff, stiffened their necks, in other words, is, is they got prideful. You know, that I understand that prideful when someone gives you godly counsel or any counsel, and you're like, hmm, like, what do you know? You got your own problems. That's pride. You're not willing to listen to what they're saying. Forget the individual. Forget who they are. Are the words true? Someone came up to me and said, "How do I, how do I take rebukes? How do I take um, correction from people?" And I says, "You have to ask yourself: Is it true? You have to ask yourself: Is what they're saying true? Okay, forget who they are and how they even said it, but is what they said true? And if it's true, then you need to stop. You need to correct it." If it's not true, then in the same sense, then you just need to say, "Thank you, Lord." I mean, uh, someone's looking out, but. You know, I'm okay there, and I'm fine. And I have had to do that. And usually when people do come to me and uh, rebuke me or correct me, um, if it's not true, they don't like the fact that I think it's not true. You know, but I'm, I stand before God, and I'm honest before Him. You have to be. You have to be because He knows your heart. And, and so you, in your relationship with Him, has to be whether someone else thinks you're not or, or not because somehow they can read hearts. But is it true? And if it is, then you need to change it. Yet they did not obey or recline their ear. They became stiffened in their necks. They did worse than their fathers. Therefore you shall speak all these words to them, but they will not obey you. You shall also call to them, but they will not answer you. So you shall say to them, this is a nation that does not obey the voice of the Lord their God, nor receive correction. Truth has perished and has been cut off from their mouths. Isn't that interesting? <clears throat> I believe it was, if I remember this correctly, I was just reading an article about, about uh, the, the, the um, separation of church and state and some of our founding fathers understanding that the reason that, and, and by the way, that's not in the Constitution or in any of the bills. That was actually the, the, um, the Baptist, I get the uh, Burberry uh, debate that these men were talking at that time the, about the separation of church and state and the reason for it all is that um, the reason for the separation of church and state was to keep the state out of the church. They wanted the church to flourish and let the church be involved in state issues, let the church do what it's supposed to do, as our founding fathers said, and, and not hinder them from, from bringing moral values in the scriptures into our political arena. And what happened in around 1948 or so, the thought began to change, that separation of church and state meant that we are to keep the church out of the government. And by 61, it really changed and said that's really what it means. And so they, they actually changed the law of God instead of applying it to and with the intent that our founding fathers had. So truth no longer existed. That's what God is saying here. They, they turned the truth and, and they really allowed it to perish. And that's where we're living at today, where truth no longer is sought as truth. Because it's relative. That's what you believe. I love those arguments. That's what you believe. You know, the Bible is very clear and is written so that a kindergartner 
can understand it. It's amazing. You try it one of these days. Go to a, a child and read something to him and say, what does that mean? And I'll guarantee you, they tell you exactly what it means. But then you go and they're like, oh, I don't know how that can... Because you're wanting to pull something out of it yourself instead of just taking it literally. It's just amazing. Don't be unequally yoked. That's what the Bible says. Well, that's not what it means, you know. I can missionary date. God said he called us to be missionaries, so that's what I'm doing, being a missionary. But the Bible says don't be unequally yoked. Yeah, but it's not a command. It's not, it's not really saying we, we shouldn't date someone. Yes, it is. <laughs> Again, you, because you have a motive, you have a reason, and so you're not going to take the word. That's where our arguments start, because we don't take the word literally, and we don't take God's word for what it says. And we have a motive. And we take God's truth and we manipulate it to fit what we think is truth. There's only one truth, by the way. You can't have two truths. There's only one. So I always love arguments because somebody is right. And who's the one that's willing to say I'm wrong? That's the one that's humble. And usually the one that's right. Not right in the sense of truth, but right heart to be able to be willing to say, you're right, that's what it says, and I can't argue against what God says. He goes on and says, cut off your hair. <clears throat> and now he's talking to Jeremiah, and Jeremiah's to lament over this whole situation. Yeah, it, it wouldn't sadden you. It would sadden anyone to be involved in a situation like this. So cut off your hair and cast it away and take up a lamentation on the desolate heights, for the Lord has rejected and forsaken the generation of wrath of his wrath for the children of judah have done evil in my sight says the lord they have set their abominations in the house which is called by my name to pollute it they brought their little idols with them can you imagine that going into the temple and they got their little idols in their pockets because they'd have little carved idols and they'd have them all over the place and they're bringing it into the lord and the lord sees all this you know and they think they're getting away and we're worshiping you lord you know, we love you, Jesus, you know, and they got their little idol here and there. That's not true love. It's polluted. And they have built the high places of Topet, which is in the valley of the sons of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire. So they were literally offering up their children as sacrifices. We don't do that today, do we? Yes, we do. It's called abortion. We give up our children for pleasure. <clears throat> because we can't financially support them, so we're willing to kill them so that we can continue on. So we still do this to this day. It's just more sophisticated, more um, humane, but is it really? Have you ever seen some of the videos on what they do to these babies? It's horrific. Uh, Some of these nurses and doctors go away sick and mentally disturbed in places. Recently, too, I heard that uh, one's coming out and talking how wrong it is now after doing it for so long. And yet they were doing it here. They're taking their sons and daughters and they were throwing them into the fire, which I did not command. God did not command abortions. God doesn't believe in woman's choice. Nor did it come into my heart. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when it will no longer, or it, when it will no more be called topet, or the valley of the sons of Hinnon, but the valley of slaughter, for they will burn in Tophet until there is no room. The corpses of this people will be food for the birds of heaven and for the beasts of the earth, and no one will frighten them away. Then I will cause to cease from the cities of Judah and from the streets of Jerusalem the voice of myrrh and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, For the land shall be desolate. Sad commentary on a rebellious people. Our nation is headed that way and individuals within the church who are struggling to be obedient to God's word. 